Hey there, decided to do an old-fashioned board solve. Uh, in one of my classes recently, we were going over this test from the 2015 10A and the 12A both and did not have time to get to this question. And so I kind of wanted to go over it. I was solving it again recently uh, and thought, let's go ahead and film it. Uh, quick announcement, I'm going to be having a new class going through the textbooks of Intro to Geo and Intro to Algebra using the AOPS textbook. If you're interested in those, they're going to start next week. Hit me up with an email or go to my website and sign up through the website if you're interested. Uh, anyhow, I thought this question was kind of fun. It's actually basically right out of chapter 10 of the AOPS book, Intro to Counting and Probability. And we're gonna be using a lot of those tactics in the problem and in the solve process. Uh, I did notice after I was getting ready to film that Richard uh, Rusick did actually film a solution to this also. So you might wanna watch his, I'm sure he will explain it quite well, uh, but it's kind of a fun problem. So I'm gonna go over it anyway, the way that I did it. Uh, let S be a square of side length one. Two points are chosen at random or chosen independently at random on the sides of s the probability that the straight line distance between the points is at least one half so greater than or equal to is this don't worry about this except to note there's a pi symbol in it probably going to have circles at some point would be my thought right then and we'll figure out when that happens when we get there it says a, b, and c are positive integers. The greatest common divisor of them is one, so they have no common divisors other than one. Uh, what is the sum of the values? Basically, find the probability that this happens, that the, the point's uh, distance is at least one half. Okay, so we'll start with the square. Let's go ahead and draw it to give ourselves some ideas, and you're just going to have this be the region S, and the side length is one. Okay. Two points chosen independently at random. When you're doing the point choice to choice, I kind of think I'd like to use a fixed value approach, meaning the first point's chosen side doesn't really matter. Why am I targeting the sides? Because that's where the point's going to end up. So pick any random side, say this one, and we're going to say the first point, we can call it X if we want, is on this side, okay? Uh, from there, Let's think about where the second point could be chosen. There are three possibilities. It could be chosen on the same side with this one. And immediately when you see there's three possibilities, if it's on the same side versus an adjacent side versus the opposite side, you should immediately think casework. Uh, casework should be just about your default approach when you're doing any problem uh, on the AMC that has probability. Meaning that if you cannot think of anything else, you can't think of another way, and you're like, how am I gonna start? Try doing casework. Just try setting that up or at least defining the parameters of what you're doing. So we're going to need a case one where uh, second point, we'll call it Y, is on the same side, the same side as X. Case two will be the adjacent side. And case three will be an opposite side. Okay, so then uh, with that, uh, let's go ahead and look at how these would play out. So all we're gonna do at this point, it's just the probability that case one occurs times the probability of success, given that case one has occurred. I'm just gonna put OCC and a parenthesis. And it's gonna be the same for all of them. So we'll do the probability of case two times success given that case two and case three times the probability of success given that case three has occurred. Well, what is the probability of case one? Same side, there's only one side that's the same side. That would be a one in four chance. There are two adjacent sides, two out of four. We'll go ahead and leave it like that for now. We might wanna write one half, but let's just leave it as two fourths. Case three, opposite side, same probability as the same side. Double check, it adds up to four out of four. That's what you want. It has to be on one of those four sides, okay? So now we'll go through this first case. This is again, textbook chapter 10, the geometric probability chapter. If you've mastered that chapter and the various problems within it, this problem should be no problem for you. Let's go ahead and proceed forward. If it's on the same side, you're basically saying, given a line segment of length one, we can put two points. And I'm gonna say uh, the 
WLOG without loss of generality, we're going to assume that one point is less than the other point. And we'll say that point is X. So we're gonna say that zero is less than or equal to X, which is less than Y, which is less than or equal to one. Now you don't have to have Y greater than X, doesn't have to be that way, but I think it makes the problem easier to think about. Okay, so now all we have to do is write what we want. We want the distance between the points to be at least one half. Well, I have a stipulation again that Y is greater than X. So you're gonna go off of this square. You're gonna jump into a different square. That square will be the square for the probability of case one. This is what geometric probability is. Sometimes it involves actual geometry. We're using a square. Other times you might be creating the geometric outcome from an algebraic expression. Okay, so we're going to say, or from dice problems or anything like that, we're gonna say that the X value, if it's going to be this normal X axis, Y is here, this goes from zero to one, this goes from zero to one. Now we've stated that Y is greater than X. Now technically that means a dotted line splitting right here. It wouldn't matter if you drew a solid line though. Keep in mind, this is a condition in my setup, which means it's not required to be that way. It could be that, you know, uh, you use the whole square. But in mine, I'm only picking points from the upper half of this square. I don't include that. This is not a possible space to land in because I defined it in my setup to be greater than X. So now we'll say, okay, what do I want for the distance between two points on the number line? That's just absolute value of a difference. And I want this to be greater than or equal to one half. So because we know in my setup that Y is greater than X, I don't need the absolute value. And I'm just gonna write Y is greater than or equal to, uh, Y minus X is greater than or equal to a half. Now I'm gonna go ahead and move that X over right now and put Y is greater than or equal to X plus a half, just to save time, okay? So I'm just gonna graph this. That's the benefit of geometric probability. You can just graph the stuff that you're stating. So uh, one half is the y-intercept. Your slope is one, which is gonna just cut up at 45 degrees and hit here, and you are above this line. So you're gonna be in this little square. Now, don't forget, if you went straight over this way, one half and one half, you're gonna get another triangle the same size as that dark triangle. And furthermore, this one and this one will also be the same size. And you can see that you're occupying one triangle out of four equally sized triangles. Again, how do we know they're equal? It's a 45, 45, 90. One half, one half, one half, one half, one half. They're all one half. So they are all congruent. This shape comes up quite a bit in these types of problems. Okay, so then we have a one in four chance. If case one occurs, we have a one in four chance of success. So this first calculation is simply going to be one fourth the chance of case one times success given that you're doing case one. And now we'll go to the next case. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this part because I don't need it on here. Uh, and the second case is going to be uh, the adjacent side problem. So if we're doing the adjacent side, two out of four chance, how are we gonna set that up? That's gonna be kind of interesting. Don't forget, we did say something about pi might be involved and I'm thinking the opposite side is guaranteed. So if we're gonna see a pi, it's probably in this part and we're gonna to have to kind of figure out how that's gonna come up. So have that in the back of your mind, kind of like the ambient uh, image or thought process that's kind of in the background, right? And so now you're going to say, all right, let's just say I have two adjacent sides. Does it matter which two? No, it's symmetric. If these two adjacent sides have no greater or worse chance than these two adjacent sides, or these two, or these two. And I don't need to do all the cases of which adjacent sides. It doesn't matter. Once you're in the setup of adjacent sides, I don't need to do any additional probability about how many ways can I have adjacent sides. That's covered right here, two out of four. We are already guaranteed to be on an adjacent side. So now let's just say that we're using these two as our proxy adjacent sides, because it doesn't matter which ones we have. And we'll call this side the Y and that the X because reasons, obviously we're comfortable with that kind of a setup in the first place. So now how will that look? X is now gonna go between zero and one from this point, which we call the origin, and Y will go from zero to one away from this point as well. And again, it doesn't matter which two sides, they all have the same probability 
because there's not an advantage that these two sides have over these two sides. So then we're just going to say, okay, let's go ahead and make another space that we're gonna calculate this probability in. And again, we could use that one, but I'm gonna make a new one, 0, 1, 0, 1, X, and Y. Now, what do I want? Why do they point on this side specifically? I don't know, let's say I pick a point here. What would I call that? Well, again, we're doing geometric probability. Why don't we call it an ordered pair? And why don't we say it's X comma zero? Because that's a pretty good choice for a point on the X axis and the Y coordinate will then be zero comma Y. Okay, I don't really wanna put it inside, but yeah, we'll put it out here on the outside. In fact, we'll put it right here. There we go. We'll use the Y value we already wrote. So now what? How am I gonna know if the distance between these points is at least one half? Well, that's what the distance formula is for. And so we're just gonna take the distance formula and you know that's gonna be the square root of their differences squared, the differences in their coordinates. So when you do zero minus X or X minus zero and you square it, it's gonna be X squared. Doesn't matter which direction you do because you're squaring a negative, it becomes positive and vice, vice versa if it's positive already, it'll be squared positive as well. Y minus zero is also going to give you Y squared. That is the distance formula, right? It's technically, again, it's X or zero minus X squared plus Y minus zero. But once you're experienced with it, you don't really need to write the zeros because they're not doing anything for you, okay? Except maybe making you feel comfortable. I want this expression to be greater than, because this is the distance, or equal to one half. And immediately you should go, well, do I like square roots? Not really. And by squaring it, you get a circle formula. And that's what we want. A circle inequality formula is created and you will have this. Don't forget to square it or you'll have issues. Okay, so now that is the radius squared. Okay, look up the circle definition formula. Uh, it's gonna be centered at the origin with the radius of one half. Here's your origin. We'll move out to one half. We'll move out to one half and it's going like this. And what do we want? Greater than. If you're greater than the circle, this is the circle over here, you're greater than it, you will be outside of the circle. So you'll be out in here. But you must maintain, again, this coordinate right here would mean that you were on this X coordinate and that Y coordinate, right? And so it doesn't matter that it's out here in space where you can't be. We're picking a point because this represents like this point right here would represent an X coordinate here and then the Y coordinate approximately here. And that's what these two, but this is a point. This is a point on our separate space. And that point is in a valid region because you are going to be outside of this circle, which means you're greater than or equal to its radius squared. Okay, so how are we gonna get that shaded region? It's like any shaded region problem. It's the total thing, the whole minus the unshaded. Now be very careful you don't do it wrong. It's pi r squared over four, one fourth of a circle area. Don't forget that your radius is one half. Be very careful here. This would be a great place to screw up your entire problem. So you square one half, you get one fourth. That turns this into one minus pi over 16. Okay, great. So now the probability of case two is two fourths. I'm gonna go ahead and write it as one half. I probably shouldn't, but whatever. It's going to be one half times one minus pi over 16. Okay, so that's that one. We have one fourth times one fourth, which is one sixteenth plus this. Finally, we have case three. Is there any way for them not to be at least one half unit apart? They're already, if I go here like a right triangle, this distance is already one. The hypotenuse, no matter where it is on here, would always be more than the, the uh, uh, side length of this right triangle that we're creating. So if I picked like the point um, on this side and this point on this side, that would be the hypotenuse we're talking about, the distance. And that's always gonna be more than the leg of one, which is the perpendicular distance from this point to the opposite side. So it is guaranteed with case three. We're just going to add plus one fourth. If you wanna write times one, feel free, but you're wasting your time, it's just one fourth. Finally, we have to calculate this. We're happy we see this pi. The box is checked, we saw it earlier. We have now achieved the goal that we knew we needed to achieve at some point. You're gonna go ahead and distribute 1 16th plus 1 half minus pi over 32 and then plus 1 fourth, which I'm going to write as something over 32, which will be eight. I'm gonna anticipate this change here. Um, we will make this, I don't even know, uh, I guess eight sixteenths for now. 
So I've got eight sixteenths, one sixteenth, that's nine sixteenths. We're gonna double this to get over 32, and we're gonna have 18, um, running out of space, equals 18 over 32. You will add eight over 32. You now have 26 minus pi all over 32. So uh, once they all have the same denominator, right, the 9 16 becomes 18 over 32. We add the 8 over 32, it's 26 over 32 minus pi over 32, which was distributed from this 1 half. This should be what we want, a minus b pi over c. Again, be careful. Don't say that b is negative 1. The minus is baked into the formula. If you say that b is negative 1, you might have issues because they're all one apart. We'll find out in a moment. Go ahead and add 26 and 32, which is 58. Add 1 to get 59. That trap answer of 58 is not here. Um, and so you're kind of lucky. Actually, it'd be 57 because you'd be at 58 if you took away one. They should have put 57. I think it would have been a good trap answer. You ran all the way to the finish line and then you tripped. That would have been fantastic, but the answer is going to be A. If you wanna do more problems like this or get good at problems like this, master every problem in chapter 10 of Intro to Counting and Probability from the Art of Problem Solving. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the problem. I'll see you in the next video.